Lord Hilton. My Lords, on behalf of my noble friend Lord Hilton, and with his permission, I beg leave to ask the question standing in his name on the order paper. <coughs> my Lords, the United Kingdom helped to secure a Security Council resolution in 2017 to establish a UN investigative team to support domestic efforts by Iraq to hold Daesh accountable by collecting, preserving and indeed storing evidence of Daesh crimes. The UK has also co-sponsored the United Nations General Assembly resolution in December 2016 that established the international impartial and independent mechanism for Syria, a step forward in ensuring both accountability for atrocities committed in that particular country. I was grateful to the noble Lord the Minister. With the fall of ISIS at Baghuz, and as that investigative team established by United Nations Security Council Resolution 2379 <coughs> begins its first mass grave excavation in Sinjar, will the Noble Lords say how the evidence of genocide will be used, what consideration is being given to establishing an international <coughs> or regional criminal tribunal to ensure that the trials are conducted with due process, and, my Lords, will he reflect that it's inevitable that the removal of citizenship from perpetrators will make it even harder to bring those responsible for genocide to justice. My Lords, um, Noble Lord's question, he raised the issue of the first mass graves. I'm sure some of us have already seen many images and I've certainly read those particular reports. And it is important that we recognise, and indeed it's quite poignant, that those mass graves have been found where Nadia Murad used to live, who won the Nobel Peace Prize and had to go through many tragic uh, circumstances herself. In terms of the specific questions, I agree with the Noble Lord about the importance of ensuring that through the passing of 2379, the first step is the collection and preservation. And in many cases, prosecutions will be best left to national authorities, and we continue to work with Iraq. I know the Noble Lord is particularly uh, key and uh, to ensure that we see local justice or indeed regional justice where it's served. It may be that some form of international or hybrid justice mechanism is used to try those most responsible crimes of international concern, and it's appropriate in the future, but it's too early at this stage to suggest where each crime will be tried. However, we are looking at all options. In terms of the, on the issue of the prosecution of perpetrators of genocide uh, where the removal of citizenship has occurred, um, I'm sure he would agree with me. The government's priority is something we all share for the safety and security of our own citizens. Those who joined Daesh have done so to face justice, and whether that's done in Iraq, once mechanisms are set up through international tribunals, or for the CPS to judge on any foreign fighters returning here, that will be a matter for the CPS and police to judge. Under the recently passed Magnitsky law, the government has the powers to prevent impunity of those guilty of grave human rights abuses by imposing visa bans and asset freezes. Will the murderers of Khashoggi be put on the government's list? My Lords, in that particular case, as the Noble Lord will be aware, that there are ongoing legal proceedings at the moment which are taking place in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia itself. I note the concerns, and it's concerns we share in general about anyone who is being tried or indeed is then convicted of crimes, and I've noted the Noble Lord's concern, but it would be inappropriate for me to comment further on an ongoing case. When international... The Noble Lord, the Minister, not agree that... Uh, the work of the British Council in Iraq is exceptional and should be further supported in its uh, determination to support the bar associations of KRG, the Kurdish regional government, and of Baghdad itself, of Iraq, the Federal Republic of Iraq together, given that in most instances local trials swiftly carried out are considerably better than international trials which may take, however wonderful, maybe 25 years, and particularly since most criminals in these instances, not just in Iraq but in the Middle East and elsewhere, are nearly always local people. Well, my noble friend speaks with great insight about Iraq, and I pay tribute to her work in that respect. When I visited Iraq, one of the notable features was that we saw some very good coordination starting to occur between both the KRG and the government in Baghdad. And as I've already said, it is our view, and I share my noble friend's view, that local justice is best served. And if we look at other occurrences of genocides elsewhere in the world, Rwanda is a good living example of how justice was served locally, accountability 
for both uh, the, uh, the perpetrators was held locally, and that country, notwithstanding many challenges that remain, is moving forward. In a week when international law showed once again in Bosnia its reach, um, is it, I hope it is, the government's commitment still to the International Criminal, criminal Court? Um, is it as strong as it always was, given the reluctance of the United States and China and others to support the ICC? And in the light of that, how long does he think it will take, either with an international court or a hybrid court, to bring to justice those who've committed atrocities, alleged atrocities, in this region? Well, Lord Stoking, Noble Lady, second question first. Um, I think that we've seen the first steps with the establishment and the passing of Resolution 2379, budget of £19 million now for that uh, preservation and the work that's being undertaken in finding evidence for those people who are currently being held. Um, so it remains to be seen, and let me assure the noble lady, we're late working with the Iraqi government to see how local justice mechanisms can be strengthened. In terms of the ICC, it needs reform. There are challenges, but we remain absolutely committed to the ICC. I would uh, not agree that with the discovery of these mass graves, it is surely time that the government said that they had prima facie evidence that genocide had been committed. Uh, and secondly, uh, would it not be helpful if the government were to say that it would support uh, whichever of the choices the government of Iraq preferred, local trials or an international, a, a hybrid international tribunal? That would surely be a helpful move. We don't have to say anything about the International Criminal Court because that will take place depending on whether its jurisdiction exists or not in Iraq. Mm. Well, that, on the issue of genocide, as the noble lord notes, that, that is a matter very much for judicial authorities to make that case. What is very clear that the mass graves are being exhumed. And I also would point out that the UN uh, special representative in that regard is Karim Khan um, QC, who is a British uh, QC. So we are working very closely, let me reassure the noble lord, with the government of Iraq to ensure that justice is primary in everyone's minds and where local justice can be strengthened we will do so and we are working very closely to ensure that objective. Lord Mexton. Leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper. My Lord, as the nature of uh, relationships between married couples and civil partnership is different to that of cohabiting siblings, the same legal and fiscal protections do not extend to siblings. The government, therefore, does not intend to make changes at this time. Why do the government refuse to accept that uh, those like sibling couples who live together permanently in um, platonic relationships are no less deserving and no less in need of fiscal and legal yeah, safeguards yeah, yeah, yeah. than those who marry or become <coughs> civil partners? Is it just or right that, amongst other uh, hardships, many platonic family couples should have to endure terrible anxiety created by the potential loss of the much-loved, jointly-owned family home because inheritance tax has to be paid when the first member of the couple dies and cannot be deferred until the death of the second. Did not the Conservative manifesto promise to take the family home out of tax? Well, I, I, my noble friend makes a, a persuasive case. When we met in December, I, I, I appreciate the meeting that we had. And he brought in uh, Catherine Attlee as well, and I thought that was a very persuasive meeting. It persuaded me to feel that it was something that needed to be looked at again, and therefore I went to uh, the Financial Secretary to the Treasury and asked him to look at it again. He did look at it again, and he pointed out in his letter to my noble friend on the 6th of February that, uh, firstly, uh, that uh, there were answer which I gave at the beginning. The second one was that uh, if uh, people ordered their affairs so that the siblings jointly held the asset, then effectively the charge would only become liable on properties exceeding £650,000 uh, in value. Uh, and that uh, if they had difficulty in making that payment, then inheritance tax could be made payable over a period of 10 years. And that was set against the fact that the average property price in the UK is 225,000. Those were the arguments put forward for retaining the position. The Minister has a strong point, and he's long 
campaigned on it with great energy and skill. My Lord, uh, he highlights much unfairness to siblings and other blood relatives who share households. It is not only the inheritance tax points. There are fiscal disadvantages in a number of areas and disadvantages in landlord and tenant in testacy uh, as well. Does the Government agree that while there is not a case, and we agree with this, for equating siblings and other blood relatives with civil partners, there is nevertheless a, a strong case for a number of reforms? <coughs> And will the government agree to establish a cross-departmental working party to look at these issues and consider what specific measures are necessary uh, to address these disadvantages? I mean, I'm happy to, to, to do that. I mean, the standard response, which all Treasury Ministers give, is to say that government policy in this area of tax is constantly under review. That has a particular meaning at the moment because the Office of Tax Simplification are undertaking a review of inheritance tax. This issue of siblings will be within scope uh, of that. They are due to report uh, in the spring, and obviously we will uh, take their findings seriously. But our position uh, is, is very clear that this reflects uh, an impact on a very small number of estates with careful tax planning, then much of the liability can be mitigated. Does the Noble Lord the Minister accept that there would be no loss to the Treasury because it would only be a question of rolling over the inheritance exactly. tax? So no loss. And can he also explain exactly what it is about, say, a short marriage of two years or a partnership of two years that would give someone tax advantages, but not two siblings living together for 50 or 60 years. What exactly is it? I mean, on the, on the point about the tax, uh, tax consequence of that, there will be a tax consequence, because in inheritance tax, the spousal trans, uh, transfer uh, is something that costs the Treasury some £2.5 billion per year. So, therefore, to, to extend the scope of that would involve a charge. And we're uh, making a judgment that, uh, in this case, it doesn't merit that. My Lords, Your Lords um, I think uh, that the Financial Secretary to the Treasury has refused to come to the Economic Affairs Committee and its subcommittee on four occasions on the loan charge and has shown himself uh, uh, unwilling to look at the evidence of hardship being caused. Might he try lobbying the Chancellor instead of the Financial Secretary <laughs> on this matter? And, and could my noble friend not acknowledge that this is not about avoiding inheritance tax, this is about people being able to continue to live in the family home, and it is unjust. And is the Liberal policy not absurd that the ability to live in the family home should depend on having a sexual relationship rather than a caring relationship? I mean, uh, uh, Lord sort of makes a... Uh, <laughs> No, Lord makes, ma makes his point. His point on, on, uh, his, his point on, the, uh, uh, on, on the loan charge was actually debated last night. We were here uh, uh, late at night, and he was mentioned by the, my old friend Lord Wakeham uh, in dispatches uh, and his, uh, his representations. But the point, uh, point remains uh, on this. We, we feel it's a small uh, number of cases. Uh, you know, if the property is worth a million pounds, then you, if you uh, divided, took into account the personal thresholds of 325,000 times two, then the liability on death of one sibling would, would amount to some £70,000 in tax, which can be spread over a period of 10 years. My Lords, um, I agree with a great deal of what the Minister said. I think it's right that the, the Treasury should have real concern about protection of the inheritance tax, my Lords. After all, avoidance of inheritance tax is basically a middle-class pastime in this country, and their, law their lawyers, any lawyer, is likely to recommend that, in fact, their people should think in terms of setting up a trust fund in order to avoid the consequences of certain aspects of the tax. My Lords, it is, the, it is now that this question, on which we've all got sympathy for the original question and the original problem, but it is now properly with the Treasury, and I'm glad that the Minister is taking up the position which he is. I'm grateful for uh, the Noble Lord's uh, support <coughs> on this. <laughs> my, Lords, um, my Lord, speakers from these benches over the years have completely supported the uh, thrust behind Lord Lexton's uh, question. Uh, and it isn't just a matter for the Treasury and tax, it's a matter of justice. Uh, and, uh, and who knows, if another party gets into power, perhaps the inheritance uh, thresholds might even come down in due course. It doesn't seem to be a strong argument 
for denying uh, an obvious need for justice in these cases. On, on the point of justice, that was tested rightly in, in court. There was a case which went there in 2008, which was uh, the Burden uh, Sisters, who took this to the European Court of Human Rights in 2008, and the European Court of Human Rights did not find that there was discrimination against them on the basis of uh, married couples when it came to inheritance tax. That was a clear decision. It's open to anybody else to challenge it uh, through the courts, but our position is clear. Brooke of Alverthorpe. I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order of paper. My Lords, there is evidence that yoga helps to build strength in healthy adults and can improve health conditions such as high blood pressure. The UK Chief Medical Officer recommends muscle strengthening activities on at least two days a week, and yoga is one of many activities recommended in their report, Start Active, Stay Active. I'm very, very grateful indeed to the uh, noble Earl for such a positive response. I'm sure he will agree with the Secretary of State's um, statement last autumn that he believes that if the NHS is to survive, we need more social prescribing by GPs, which will help with the financial position. Um, I'm sure he will agree that uh, yoga, given what he's just said, is very helpful with people with mental health problems, helps people with back pains, it helps with uh, uh, people tackling addictions, uh, with uh, people with obesity, there's a whole range of subjects there. Would he be willing to consider uh, meeting with a group of uh, representatives, and I declare an interest as the co-secretary of the All Party Group on Yoga, uh, to discuss how we might take this forward, particularly in the context of the 10-year programme which is being drawn up to try to uh, offer people uh, uh, greater movements towards better health and, at the same time, save the NHS money. Yeah, yeah. My Lord, the uh, noble Lord is quite right. The importance of uh, social pr prescribing uh, can be felt right across the population, and particularly in relation to uh, mental health. And of course, yes, I do agree with my uh, right honourable friend, uh, uh, Secretary of State, in, uh, in, in what he said about social prescribing, and it's one of his top priorities. Um, the noble uh, Lord um, also asked if uh, an, a meeting could be arranged uh, uh, with, uh, 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 with me, with, for, with the, um, himself and other interested parties. I will pass that request on to the Minister responsible, and I think perhaps he might have a very useful conversation with them. My lords, in view of fact, my lords, in view of the fact that uh, it is acknowledged that yoga uh, is very beneficial for mental health, it is also uh, provides mindfulness, it provides an ability to give better judgments, to relax, to actually take uh, decisions in a sensible and responsible way. Would he not agree with me that uh, yoga should now be made obligatory for members of the House of Commons? <laughs> my Lords, my noble friend makes yes. a very important point about the importance of yoga and the great benefits that it gives to everybody. I have actually unrolled my mo yoga mat in my office, and I'm waiting for a lesson from my noble friend, uh, Baroness Barron, who is a uh, teacher of yoga. Yeah. appear to be particular benefits of yoga for older people uh, in terms of improving balance and muscle tone. Uh, NICE estimates that falls cost the NHS more than £2.3 billion a year. And of course, we also know that older people often become lonely, so the mental health and social benefits of going to classes also apply. So, given these facts, will the government encourage yoga for older people? Yes, uh, 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 Noble Baroness is quite right. The only proviso, as far as that's concerned, uh, more frail elder people should take great care. Uh, uh, yes, the Noble Baroness does a, uh, does a hand movement, which I think uh, 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 describes that exercise. Um, <laughs> anyway, deep breath. <laughs> But um, uh, the, the noble baroness is quite right, and um, the importance of uh, social uh, subscribing and yoga are a great advantage to the population. Yeah. Yeah. My lords, I've just. Uh, this side. My lords, 
I don't know whether the Minister will be aware, but East London NHS Mental Health Trust have for seven years been running and evaluating sports programmes, including yoga, but many others, for people with severe mental health problems. And just to give an example, their boxing programme for people, forensic uh, patients, those with severe mental health programmes and a criminal history, has shown that 100% of those involved have achieved a significant improvement in their mental health well-being. Will the Minister make uh, the NHS England aware of the work in East London and issue guidance to mental health trusts across the country that really they should all be running a range of sports programmes for people with severe mental health programmes? Yeah. Um, the Noble Baroness is quite right. Uh, the, the importance of uh, these uh, uh, various uh, forms are uh, 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 well felt and well made. Um, the, the, I'm not sure, I don't know the, uh, the actual event that uh, the Noble Baroness described, but I know in um, Haringey, CCG have created a better care fund to improve health and social care services for older people, and particularly with long term health conditions. Strength and balance, which refers also to the Noble uh, uh, Baroness Lady Warnsey's question, is one of the programmes funded by this partnership. And I will, of course, make, uh, 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 make this point to the Department, but I also should say that the social. So, so, prescribing, uh, uh, which is uh, promoted by uh, my uh, uh, right honourable friend, the Secretary of State, is gaining uh, uh, more and more areas are getting involved in it, and uh, it is without doubt doing a great job. I just discovered that you can do downward dog on these pages. <laughs> I invite mobile lords to join me. Um, so, with the evidence uh, showing that yoga and mindfulness can be good for preventing and curing illnesses, both physical and mental, could the Minister um, uh, tell us what progress has been made with the establishment of a National Academy for Social Prescribing, and if representatives of yoga and mindfulness practice will be on it? Thank you. My Lords, uh, I thank the Noble Lord for that question. Uh, yes, the National Academy for Social Prescribing. Um, engagement, engagement with stakeholders uh, uh, has already begun, and they are being consulted, and the Academy is under development. The, uh, uh, the Noble Lord also mentioned uh, getting representatives of yoga and mindful, some mindfulness practice involved. And I have uh, asked the, that uh, the Department and NHS England if representatives of yoga and mindfulness will be to be engaged in its development. I can bear witness to the efficacy of workplace yoga, as I attended many of the lunchtime sessions, which were organised by my noble friend, uh, for seated yoga before the Christmas break. And I enjoyed them very much, and I commend them to all members of the House. Um, and uh, Noble Lords will be very relieved to know that uh, MPs and peers and other staff were not required to don their lycra during the lunchtime. <laughs> um, so could I ask the Noble Lord, the Minister, um, if he is aware of the amount of uh, workplace yoga and yoga that's being encouraged actually for NHS staff? To, for their, not only for their well-being, but also for their physical well-being, for those who are having to deal with lifting heavy weights and, and all of those things. And that, that, uh, that's, that programme should be rolled out across the whole of the NHS. Yeah. Uh, the Noble Baroness makes a very good uh, uh, point. She, what she didn't mention was uh, what good, how good yoga is for stress and how to actually um, uh, 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 reduce one's stress levels. Yes, because... Um, Movement, breathing, meditation. I wasn't aware of... I know that in various uh, workplaces, um, uh, yoga classes are available, uh, but um, I wasn't aware about the NHS programme, but I, of course, will uh, bring it to the attention of the Department. Baroness Thomas of Winchester. I beg leave to ask the question, standing in my name on the order paper. My Lords, the Government will consult later this year on its plans to introduce the Future Home Standard for new build homes to be future proofed with low carbon heating and world leading levels of energy efficiency. Separately, the Government is currently working on a review of its accessibility standards for new homes. I thank the Noble Lord the Minister for that answer. And, but I do think this is so important. Only 7% of housing, the housing stock, is accessible and adaptable. Will the government use this opportunity to ensure that developers are required to build to the more inclusive, accessible and adaptable 
Category 2 standard. My, my Lords, first of all, if I could pay tribute to the, the noble lady for her continued tenacity in, in this area, and quite, quite rightly so. Uh, my Lords, uh, document M, which relates to the accessibility standards, will be reviewed this, this year. This is part of a review of all building regulations consequent on the Government's policy and on the Hackett Review, my Lords. Um, does the Minister agree with the Building Research Establishment that taking six years to introduce the future home standards is an exceptionally long time. Can you tell us why it can't be done sooner? And my second question is this. This is an extraordinary opportunity to introduce an integrated set of lifetime homes standards into a set of standards which will hold forever. And this is surely what we need for an ageing population. Yeah, yeah. And this ageing population, if it could stay in its own homes while it grows old and frail, could help the health service and the care services enormously in terms of costs and benefits. Does he not agree with me that we must not miss this opportunity? Well, Lord, for, for, first of all, as she knows, document L relates to carbon uh, standards in relation to heating and environmental standards. Docu document M, as she, as she knows, relates to accessibility. This is part of a suite of, of documents, and each has to be reviewed separately, consequent upon Hackett, and ensuring that we get the, the programme right. The noble lady is right that six years is a considerable time. It is, of course, by 2025, 2025 so I can offer her that reassurance that it could be within that time. It could be earlier than that. But we do want to get it right, and it's important we have a thorough consult consultation, my lords. Uh, my noble friend Baroness Thomas of Winchester um, uh, 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 mentioned the Category 2 standard. Building homes to that Category 2 standard is currently an optional standard, but one adopted in some places. And it is the standard which reflects the lifetime home standard. Does the Minister agree that actually it should be made compulsory? Yeah. Very good. My, my Lords, first of all, I'm very much in favour of the, the review, but I don't want to prejudge the review, view, my Lords. I think it's important that that is, is left to take its own course. But it is certainly the case, and picking up on a point the noble Baroness uh, La La Lady Andrews made, that it is important that we do look at uh, these, the durability of these standards with a view to not only people who are disabled, but people who are ageing. We have an ageing population, and the Government is very much committed to the industrial strategy grand challenge mission on ageing, quite a mouthful, but which means people to live five extra years in good health by 2035. So it plays into that. So it all plays to that agenda. But I don't think we should prejudge the consultation, my lords. My lord, I declare an interest as president of the Sustainable Energy Association, and we greatly welcome the Chancellor's move to require the house builders to up their standards of energy efficiency and carbon uh, neutral uh, house building. That technique of using building regulations to make the house builders do things that they otherwise wouldn't do must apply also to accessible housing. Uh, exhorting house builders to do the right thing and produce more accessible homes doesn't get us anywhere. Uh, they're doing very well, thank you, as it is. We need to have those building regulations changed in a compulsory way, as the noble Lord Lord Chipley uh, states, to uh, do the great things that the noble Baroness, Baroness uh, Thomas of Winchester has advocated for so long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, my, my Lord, the, the, the noble Lord, who does much good work in, in this area, for, for which I th thank him, makes a very powerful case. But it is the powerful case as to the, why we've had the Hackett Review, why we're having the review of building regulations, and why we will act consequent upon that. So I think it's all moving in that direction. It isn't the only thing that's happening, of course. The eco-obligation puts an obligation on energy companies so that uh, energy bills and less carbon uh, energy is happening as well. But it is certainly very, very central. And I, again, I, I, I would speak to the importance of, of uh, Document M on accessible housing. It's provided for in NPPF planning framework and in the Neighbourhood Planning Act as well, the requirement to take account of the interests of people with disabilities and an ageing population. So it's all moving in that direction, my lords. Uh, my lords, I refer the House to my relevant registered interests. The Chancellor Exchequer has told us he fully supports the need for future-proofed new homes, but does not think we should wait until 2025 for them to tackle energy efficiency and carbon reduction. 
Can the Noble Lord then please explain why the Government scrapped the Zero Carbon Homes Plan in 2015 and in 2016, during the passage of the dreaded Housing and Planning Act, the Government opposed the introduction of carbon compliance standards for new homes that would have helped reduce carbon emissions and given people lower fuel bills? My, my Lords, f- first of all, it is important to note that the energy standard for new homes has improved by over 30 per cent since 2010, also reducing energy bills by £200 per annum for, per household on average. So I think that is indicative of the progress that has been made. The Noble Lord referred to previous policies which depended to some extent on offsetting, which was not a direct uh, impact, which this will be. This will have direct impact. It will be look- looking at things like heat pumps looking at things like solar panels, replacement of old gas boilers. These are the things that will have a direct impact, my Lords, rather than the the old offsetting principle. And I think to that extent it's very much to be welcomed.